Hello, welcome to Science with Gurney. From this video playlist onwards, we'll discuss environmental chemistry and a lot of principles associated with it. Most of the stuff that we're going to look at is taught in third year chemistry classes. And I hope that by the end of this video series, you gain an appreciation and a fascination of the field. It's quite an emerging field. It's, it's quite relevant for us and our future children, their grandchildren, and so on, because we're going to be looking at real-life issues that affect us, and more importantly, these issues will go on to affect our future generations if we don't do something about it. The best way to do anything to mobilize a change in this field is to study it, to bring upon a scientific revolution. Um, and I really hope that you guys get a sort of fundamental understanding of the field and that you learn to appreciate how wonderful this field is for humanity. That being said, it's also quite a complex field. So I challenge you to challenge yourselves to go through these videos and more importantly to try some practice questions after you. That being said, let's get into the material. We'll be looking at Introduction to Environmental Chemistry or Atmosphere Chemistry and some of the questions that we'll be examining, we aren't atmospheric scientists yet, but we can start looking at some of the questions they ask and we will see that mainly it's centered around a theme on pollutants. More importantly, the chemistry of these pollutants. So we'll be looking at things such as, you know, what's the effect of these pollutants on the environment? How long do they live? So their lifetimes. And that's measured quantitatively by something called a P1 half or a half-life. We'll talk about that later in a simple way. It's just basically the amount of time required to drop the concentration from you know, let's say 100% to 50%. So you want to reduce the concentration by a half and you want to examine the time it takes for that to happen. We'll look at this in a little bit more detail soon enough. We will also be looking at, you know, the source and sink of these uh, pollutants. So sources and sinks basically refer to the fact that sources are the origins of these pollutants. For example, some pollutants are formed from, you know, coal plants, We'll be looking at those in a second as well. And then we're looking at sinks. Okay, where do they go? So a sink could be a human body. If, if you're inhaling a pollutant, it can accumulate in your fatty tissue, maybe. Um, in that case, you're the sink. And it's not really good because it's bad for your health. Uh, we'll look at those processes, you know, where do these pollutants go? Where do they come from? And based on that, we'll see that there's quite some remarkable facts that um, become apparent about pollutants. So, that being said, uh, studying the atmosphere is not an easy job. There's actually millions, there's millions to billions of reactions that are occurring in the environment at, um, con uh, simultaneously. So it's, it's quite complex to actually, you know, study all of them at one time, right? So if you actually wanted to do that, you'd have to couple all of these differential equations. Differential equations describe rates of change. We'd have to combine them and then we'd have to solve them numerically, which is quite impossible to do, at least in our current time. So how do we overcome that problem? We reduce complexity by compartmentalization. We form compartments. So instead of looking at a billion reactions at once, we might form a little compartment and we might look at a few hundred thousand reactions or maybe a few thousand reactions or maybe even a few reactions. So compartments are quite important in this regard. Compartments, um, they can be large or they can be small. So large scale compartments are basically, you know, we can divide them into roughly five parts. They're the atmosphere, that's the gases around us above our heads. There's the hydrosphere, hydro meaning water. So, you know, river bodies, lakes, oceans, water bodies, I mean, that forms the hydrosphere. The biosphere constitutes life, bio meaning life. And the geosphere constitutes land, okay? Then what's this anthrosphere? This anthrosphere is human specifically, okay? The effects anthropogenic. 
basically coming from human activities. You know, we are a part of the biosphere, but we give this sphere a separate compartment because, um, you know, the effects created by this sphere are far more predominant than those created by the biosphere alone. So we wouldn't want to, you know, group these two biosphere and anthosphere together and then let's call it, let's say, X-sphere. And then we say, oh, you know, global warming is caused by X-sphere. Um, and since X-sphere also includes mammals and animals and bacteria, we don't want to be assigning them the blame that should actually be 100% assigned to our faults and our greed as capitalists. Um, so that's why we have anthosphere on its own. So like I said, compartments can also be small scale. For example, you can look at a river system, you can look at a lake, and if you even want to go smaller than that, you can. You could look at a person, um, you could also look at a fish, you could look at a bear, anything. So for example, you could look at the time it takes for a pollutant to be ingested by the person and then it's excreted and you can examine how long does it take for that to happen right how long does it take for pollutant X to go inside of the human body and then to come out so we might want to look at things like T the residence time in the human body um, so this is what I mean that you can have small scale compartments as well Another important thing to know is that matter and energy are constantly transferred between all of those big scale compartments um, and also small scale compartments as well. There's always a transfer of mass and energy. So let's consider something. Let's consider the hydrological cycle, which is the water cycle. Now it's important to note that the water cycle only describes physical changes. Physical changes are those that basically change structure okay so there might be a phase transition you're boiling water okay so let's say you have water you boil it on your pot you want to make tea and it goes from a liquid to a vapor phase that's a physical change there's actually no bonds being broken if you had a microscope that looked at those water molecules individually you would see there's no bonds being broken or being formed there's just a phase transition okay now in the hydrological cycle, you guys have done this a lot, I think, since you guys have been young. Um, so let's not go into a lot of detail. It's not that relevant to our discussion. I just want to highlight the fact that um, these compartments have changes going between them. So what I mean by that is water in the hydrological cycle, um, it exists as liquid water in the oceans. And you get a lot of heat from the sun. And that evaporates the water. So this Q means heat in thermodynamics. Those of you who have taken physical chemistry will know that Q stands for heat. In science, we're lazy somewhat. And we don't like, you know, putting out words every time, heat, thermodynamics. So we give them symbols. It's no big deal. So I add heat, so I put that plus sign. That causes the liquid water to go into gaseous state. And evaporation occurs. Once the water is in the atmosphere, it starts cooling down because as we know, the atmosphere is cold. Many of you who travel in planes, I'd advise you to step outside the plane if you don't believe me and you will see that indeed it is very cold. Probably not a good idea to do, but it's a recommendation. Um, anyways, so in the atmosphere, we have our water and it cools down and we get cloud formation. And when it cools down, heat escapes. So that's why I have the minus Q over here. So then this gaseous water starts condensing, it forms clouds, and then when they reach this critical point, the water starts falling back down to the earth in the form of rainfall. This is the physical cycle. Um, physical changes are occurring in this hydrological cycle. Now you may ask, well, which cycles involve chemical changes? And the answer to that is elemental cycles. So if we look at compounds like water, we consider mostly physical cycles for them. But for elemental cycles like elements, when we study them and we look at how they're exchanged from one compartment to another, we see it's in the form of chemical reactions um, where bonds are formed and broken. So Again, we won't look at this cycle in a lot of details because you've done it before. We'll only look at a few key reactions, okay? So one of the major key reactions is basically responsible for life on Earth, and that is nitrogen fixation, okay? So you get atmospheric nitrogen gas, N2, and then somehow it's converted to NO3 to minus nitrate ions, which can be used by plants. 
how is it how is this process done it's done due to bacteria certain bacteria in the soil okay we won't be looking at the biological reactions that occur um, but take my word for it these bacteria convert nitrogen into ammonium and then they get oxidized further into nitrate which is usable for plants now this is the nitrogen cycle for the biosphere very necessary for it in the anthrosphere we we can basically form fertilizers from nitrogen so we can take nitrogen from the air add some hydrogen gas to it and then we get an equilibrium reaction that forms nitrogen uh, ammonia and then you know the opposite of it is the dissociation reaction which goes back so we get this back and forth reaction and then we can control it with the help of Le Chatelier's principle to get the reaction to go mostly in the forward direction and we get a fertilizer um, this is a cycle because the same fertilizer is then used by plants and then you know nitrogen is released back into the air now this process this first reaction over here where we had the N2 go to NO3 to minus that's called nitrification and it's an important process if we did the reverse of it so let's say we went to NO3 to minus back to environmental gas N2 um, when plants are done using NO3 to 2 minus that's called denitrification and it's the reverse process and it's also done by certain bacteria in the soil okay then in the environment N2 can also have this fate it can be transformed into N2O which is laughing gas um, and it's done in the presence of lightning environmental lightning when there's lightning in the air we get some of the nitrogen that's around it gets heated and excited and reacts with the oxygen molecules to form laughing gas now Let's move on to the carbon cycle. This one most of us are most familiar with. We've taken biology, biology classes. And the key reactions in the carbon cycle consist of photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So as you can see, these two are opposite processes. Photosynthesis makes glucose, which is energy rich. Cellular respiration uses glucose to get energy out of it it uses this energy rich molecule to drive the energy okay so photosynthesis photo meaning light hence the h neo part that's the light that's required for this reaction to occur and synthesis referring to the fact that you're synthesizing glucose molecules okay now this is of course very important for humans um, the end product, not photosynthesis. We don't engage in photosynthesis. Plants do it due to a specialized cellular organelle called chlorof chlorophylls. They help um, photosynthesize in plants. So in humans, in the mitochondria, which is also a cellular structure, we take C6H12O6, in the presence of oxygen and energy is derived as a result now this isn't a biology class so i won't really go into the details of this reaction um, those of you who've taken introductory biology know that it is quite a complicated process so we won't talk about it i really can't explain it in the few minutes that are left in the video um, but just take my word for it that these two are extremely important key reactions that occur um, and they are part of the carbon cycle. This is how carbon is continuously exchanged between the environment and living beings in this case. So here we basically have transfer between the environment or let's say the atmosphere and the biosphere. Okay, so this is one major, major, major reaction that's important for the biosphere and the anthrosphere. So with that, this video comes to an end and we will pick up our discussion by looking at pollutants and stuff like that. I hope this video helped you. If you have any suggestions for me, please let me know in the comment section and please stay, uh, stay in touch, watch these videos and I hope they help you. Thank you so much.